Oh, well, hello, and thank you for joining us. I'm Father Nick, uh, your priest and pastor at the Fort Church of St. Martin's Parish, and uh, with me again is the Reverend Dr. Ross Wright uh, to discuss how did we get the New Testament, uh, our uh, Christian education series, and uh, particularly to discuss um, what's known as the synoptic problem. And we recognize that's a jargon word, uh, so or jargon term, so we're going to unpack it for you. But the synoptic problem, uh, Q, or the Q source, uh, and the Didache, these might all be new words for you. Uh, but don't worry, stick with us, and we'll, we'll explain it. But before we do, Ross, how are you? I'm doing great, and I'm delighted to be a part of this conversation. Thank you. All right. Well, let's let's uh, let's jump right in, and uh, just begin by maybe uh, clarifying these these jargon terms and these words that might be uh, a little bit unfamiliar. Um, maybe I'll start with uh, with with the um, term synoptic, and and you can add in anything you want. Um, the synoptic gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Those three gospels. Now, you of course you remember that. In our New Testament, there's only four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but three of them are lumped together as the synoptic Gospels. And this is uh, from uh, the Greek, uh, syn, S-Y-N, not S-I-N, or, or soon, uh, means uh, with or together. Uh, and then optic, uh, that, that should be a word that's familiar to, to everybody. Um, you know, the, this has to do with seeing or our, or our eyes. So uh, to talk about Matthew, Mark, and Luke as the synoptic gospels, <clears throat> it means uh, at the very least that they can be seen together uh, and that they seem to see together. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, Ross, you, did you want to add to that? Uh, yes, just to point out that the when we talk about the synoptic um, problem, we're talking about the fact that the, there's overlapping material uh, in these three Gospels. And um, you might want to think about it as columns uh, where you can see things lined out. We'll show you an image in, in a little bit where you can see several texts that allow us to do this. So it's the synopsis is seeing uh, in parallel fashion the material that is shared by these three Gospels, and also um, seeing where there are differences. Uh, I think it's a simple way to uh, suggest what synopsis means and edge towards the synoptic problem. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's great. I mean, what, what happened was uh, that in the history of uh, the church and of the Christian faith, uh, as these writings were, were being uh, taken down for the first time, the autographs produced and then, uh, and then put together, um, this, this thing that we have of uh, a Bible that's one book that's uh, all bound together, Genesis to the Apocalypse or Revelation, uh, that's something that really doesn't start to happen until um, towards the end of antiquity, uh, towards the beginning of uh, the medieval church, to have all of these things bound together in a book in that way. Uh, instead, um, sometimes scrolls, sometimes uh, codices, um, a codex is, is essentially a, um, a proto book, uh, an early form of the book. Uh, that Christians would write on these. Sometimes they'd write on, on um, uh, you know, sheets of, uh, of um, papyrus collected and or vellum co collected into a, codice, a codex or into a, um, a scroll. Sometimes they'd, they'd write over um, uh, papyrus uh, or, or um, vellum pages that already had had writing on them. They often reused. Uh, this is a, called a palimpsest uh, when when it's written on top of something that that's had writing that's faded. Uh, you know, writing was expensive. Copying was expensive, uh, and so sometimes the books would be put together 
Uh, and what happened was, uh, and we'll talk more about this as we talk about the development of the canon, but what happened was, you know, the books started to be collected, certain books started to be collected together. The letters of Paul would be collected together. Uh, the um, gospels would be collected together. Uh, there's a scene in um, St. Augustine's Confessions, and I, I, I know I've mentioned this recently in, in some context, so it might have been in one of the other videos or, or maybe in a Zoom discussion or something totally other, but there's a scene in um, uh, St. Augustine's Confessions when he um, is um, kind of has this moment of conversion and he, he hears this voice saying, um, tole lege, uh, pick up and read. And he's got a, um, a book and he picks it up and he reads and uh, he just lets it kind of fall open to where he'd been reading and he reads that passage. And he reads from uh, Paul's letter to the Romans. Uh, and uh, you might think that he's got a Bible in his hand, but he doesn't. He's got a collection, a, a codex that's a collection of just Paul's letters, so it doesn't have anything else in it. Um, well, what this means is that uh, the church kind of developed a way of reading through the texts. One, uh, you know, you move from one text to the next, and especially within the liturgical life of the church, we still do this. Uh, uh, for example, in the way that the lectionary works in our church now, we read uh, through uh, in what we call year A, we read through the gospel according to Matthew. And then uh, the next year, which we label year B, we read through the gospel according to Mark. And then the next year, year C, we read through the gospel according to Luke in our lectionary, that is in our, in our text that we read Sunday morning for worship. And then we come back around and start with Matthew again. And, and we've got John kind of sprinkled in there throughout uh, all three years. But uh, that way of reading really gets you to focus on the story that you're hearing at that moment. And uh, Ross, what you were kind of alluding to is that in the, <clears throat> in the 19th century, uh, and, and even starting a little bit before that uh, in the 18th century, after uh, you know the the printing press had kind of risen to prominence and, and it, it became much easier to mass produce uh, things like Bibles uh, and to print them in different ways, what scholars began to do is to set these texts next to each other. So instead of reading through Matthew and then you get to the end of Matthew, and then you start Mark, and you read through Mark, and then you get to the end of Mark, and you stop. Instead, they could set Matthew and Mark and Luke right next to each other. And in doing this, uh, and looking uh, kind of across the three, they could see where there were um, deep similarities and also profound differences. And those deep similarities <clears throat> were not just similarities in the kind of overall story that's being told or, or the kind of overall narrative and picture, uh, but precise linguistic similarities. That is to say, the same unique Greek phrase might be used in Matthew and in Mark and in Luke in a particular place. And you think, you know, it's very unlikely that these three writers, if they're writing entirely independent of one another, would use the same exact Greek words, especially if the three of them independent of each other are thinking back or have heard a story about something Jesus said in the language that he spoke, which wasn't Greek, but was Aramaic. So, you know, if Ross is thinking back to something Jesus said in Aramaic, and I'm thinking back to something Jesus said in Aramaic, and, and Ross decides to translate that from Aramaic into Greek, and I decide to translate it from Aramaic into Greek. It's very unlikely that we're going to come up with the exact same Greek vocabulary and syntactic construction as one another. 
we're going to translate differently. I mean, that's, that's just uh, the nature of translation. Uh, and so when you see three different texts side by side, and they have the same vocabulary, and they have the same grammar and syntax in a particular section, and they don't in other sections, you start to think they must have some kind of reliance on one another or on some other text uh, that, that all three are referring back to. And that, 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 is, that just is the synoptic problem. The, the question of why do these different texts have certain passages that are uh, the same in uh, Greek vocabulary, grammar, and syntax in some places and then not in others. Is, is that uh, basically the way you see it, Ross? Yeah, that's really a great explanation. And I thought I, I might just give a couple of examples. Um, there's a place in the Gospels, in all three Gospels, synoptic Gospels, where there's a reaction to Jesus' teaching. People are amazed at Jesus' teaching. And each of the Gospels say this almost word for word the same. They were astonished at his teaching because he taught with authority. It's a simple phrase, simple construction. But if you think about it, why would they have described Jesus in exactly word for word the same way? It's theoretically possible that they might remember Jesus' actual words. If someone had a, a photographic memory, uh, or not photographic memory, but if they had an audible memory, <clears throat> that I mean, it's theoretically possible that the words could be so uh, remember in such detail that they would have chosen similar words, although I think Nick's point about the translation is, is important. But it would be very unusual for them to use exactly the same words to describe a person's actions or characterization. Um, another example of what makes us think that there's a literary relationship between these three gospels or among them is that they also adopt the same sequence of events. And sometimes they'll adopt the same sequence of narrative events, even when it doesn't make particular logical sense. Uh, an example of this is um, the description of John the Baptist. There is a um, point in all three synoptic gospels where right in the middle of Jesus narrating Jesus's ministry, there's a pause and a flashback to the death of John the Baptist. And then the narrative picks up with, with Jesus teaching. It's a very unusual uh, pause. It doesn't make any particular logical sense. And so scholars look at this and they think, it's possible to think of one person coming up with this, but it would be very unusual for all three to do a flashback right in the middle of a narrative sequence that doesn't seem to make any particular reference to John the Baptist. So that, those are a couple of examples. And so the synoptic problem, simple way to put it is, scholars have looked for a way to explain both the similarities, but also the differences. Why are there differences? And how do we make sense of both similarities, you know, verbal correspondence on the one hand, but also um, significant differences? Yeah, that, that's right. And so and it's important to, to just kind of, uh, reiterate this, this is true for Mark and Matthew and Luke. It's not so much true for, for John. Uh, it's not that John doesn't tell some of the same stories. He certainly does. It's not that John doesn't, um, you know, have at his beginning the baptism of Jesus, which is the beginning of Jesus, you know, inaugurates Jesus's adult ministry in, in all of the gospels. And of course, ends with the crucifixion and resurrection. But in terms of narrative structure, that's about all that John shares with Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, um, a good example of some of the differences, and we'll talk more about this when we get to John's gospel, but in uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus only goes to Jerusalem once in his adult life. Uh, he only goes there uh, to be... Uh, arrested and uh, handed over and crucified. That's, that's what happens when he goes to Jerusalem once in his 
adult life during his ministry. However, if you read John's gospel, Jesus is all the time going back and forth between Galilee, the Galilee and, and Judea, all the time making trips to, um, to Jerusalem. Uh, and um, another example is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, for example, will uh, connect Jesus's what's known as the cleansing of the temple uh, to the final week of Jesus's life. And, and it seems to be in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the event that really kind of gets him killed, basically. Uh, this is the event that, that puts him not just in the way of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but also gets him, uh, uh, you know, gets Roman interest in what he's doing. And, uh, and it's after this event that, that um, those who wish to uh, have him arrested and crucified begin to plot to find a way to do that. And they, they um, find Judas. So it, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this event of Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey uh, on Palm Sunday, and then uh, cleansing the temple uh, on uh, the Monday or sometimes the Sunday evening, uh, that's all within the last life of uh, the last week of the life of Jesus. In John's gospel, that's one of the very first things Jesus does in his public ministry. At the very beginning of John's gospel, Jesus does that. So it just gives you a sense of how different the story is. John is not synoptic for that reason. He doesn't seem to share this overarching narrative or those specific Greek uh, linguistic constructions and, of, of sentences. So um, maybe, maybe we'll leave John aside and, and, and say, uh, let's pick up on this idea of the narrative uh, structure that all three of them share, because there, there's really uh, three main hypotheses, three main ways of trying to explain this material that seems to be shared between uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, there's some other material we're going to get back to in a minute, uh, that's shared just between Matthew and Luke, uh, but there's uh, there's much more material that's shared between the three of them, uh, and and a, a big part of that is the the narrative structure. Um, did you want to say anything about that, Ross? Yes, uh, just to to sort of summarize what we said so far and to clarify. The synoptic problem is claiming that one of the Gospels was written first and that the other two Gospels, other two synoptic Gospels, had the first Gospel to look at, as it were, spread out before them. Whether that was literally true or not, the point is that they were, the two later Gospels were uh, making use of the first Gospel. And as we'll explain in just a minute, there are two main theories about which one was written first but we're talking about the literary relationship among these three synoptic gospels on the assumption that, the, that one was the lead gospel or was written first, and then the other two made use of it. Would this be a time to sort of jump into kind of the basic options or basic theories? Yeah, I think so. Let me, let me just uh, say one thing real quick, which is that uh, this shouldn't be a, a, a shock to anybody. This really shouldn't be a surprise that, that, that the Gospels uh, have some sort of dependence upon one another uh, as, as a source. Um, we hear this actually in the Gospel of Luke itself in, in the uh, very first chapter uh, when Luke, uh, the the author of the gospel, according to Luke, um, kind of lays out his little prologue. He says, inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things which have been accomplished among us, just as they were delivered to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, uh, 
that you may know the truth concerning the things which you have been which you have been informed this is luke chapter 1 verses 1 through 4 and then in other words what all all luke's saying there is uh yeah there's some other gospels out there besides this one that i'm i've just written and i consulted those and i consulted some other sources uh and tried to put things down as best i could and that's basically what he's saying here he's telling us that he has relied on on some other gospel and some other source to write his gospel. So this is it's in scripture itself that there's this matter of literary dependence. So so the real question is uh, which which text has priority between the three? That is, which one was written first, and the other two uh, are somehow dependent on it. And um, there's, there's really kind of two main contenders. Uh, and one of them is uh, Mark in priority, that the Gospel of Mark was written first. And that plays out in two different hypotheses, which we'll, we'll uh, talk about in a minute. And the other one is uh, Matthean, or uh, the Gospel of Matthew having priority, being the one written first. Um, and, uh, and that has its own hypothesis that goes along with it. Ross, did you wanna start off with, with um, the possibility of, of the priority of Matthew? Oh, you want me to start with Matthew? Sure. Um, let me lead into this by saying that the um, scholarly consensus these days is that Mark was probably written first, and we'll look at that in a second. But there has always been uh, there have always been scholars and readers of the scriptures who believed that Matthew was risen first. Um, and it looks, it would have looked something like this, that Matthew's gospel was written first. Uh, Luke then was looking at Matthew, as it were, and taking a lot of the narrative structure and a lot of content as well from Matthew's gospel. But Luke also left some things out that uh, Matthew included and added some things that Matthew doesn't have. That's a nice, yeah. Um, thank you, Nick. So you got Matthew uh, is, is the source for Luke. And then the idea is that Mark, uh, if it was written last, which is the theory with Matthew in priority, at least in this model, is that Mark had both Matthew and Luke in front of him and wrote essentially an abbreviated version of the two, that he did a collation and, uh, and, and shortened form. So he left out quite a bit uh, of material that's in Matthew and Luke, though the narrative structure is uh, largely intact. All right, and this, <clears throat> you'll see at the bottom of the screen in the share screen here, but for those who are listening uh, and, and not able to see the, uh, what we have up on the screen, this is known as the Griesbach uh, hypothesis uh, after a, um, a German scholar who put it forward, um, German New Testament scholar in the 19th century who, who uh, made this argument. It, it actually predates uh, Griesbach and the 19th century um, German biblical uh, scholarship. Uh, St. Augustine of Hippo in the um, fourth century uh, not, not what we would call a modern biblical scholar, but, uh, but someone who certainly thought about, uh, scriptures a lot and, and was at home in them and, and, uh, and did have some kind of interest in, in how they came about and how they were put together. Uh, he also suggested that this is perhaps the way that it happened, that Matthew wrote first, that, that Luke used and changed Matthew and that Mark uh, took Matthew and Luke and uh, kind of created what's sometimes called the Reader's Digest version mm -hmm. of, uh, of Matthew and Luke. Um, Ross, uh, there, there's some reasons why I, I find this to be problematic, and I, I imagine there are some for you also. What, what are some of the reasons that you're unconvinced by this one? Yeah, yeah, there's several. Um, one problem with the Griesbach hypothesis has to do with material that Mark decided 
not to include. If he was written last and he did this condensed version, it meant that he would have left out some really juicy parts of the gospel, like um, the Sermon on the Mount, with, which both Matthew and Luke include, uh, the Lord's Prayer, which is not in Mark. Uh, Mark does not have any of the birth narratives. And so people who have raised questions about the Griesbach hypothesis have done so partially on the, on the grounds that it seems highly implausible that Mark would have left out uh, this material that seems so important to the life of Jesus. So that's one of the reasons why, um, why there, there are questions. Um, another question, this is a little more technical, but um, some of the material that Matthew and Luke share but is not shared by Mark Oh, so let me let me start this over again. Um, Mark has some material that's not in Matthew and Luke, but it tends to be material that's either narratively or theologically complicated. Um, I won't go through all the details, but there's some there's some tricky passages, things that are not sort of obvious or don't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, there's some unusual vocabulary. Um, there's some things that just um, don't lie easily on the page, so to speak. And it um, doesn't mean that they're not true, but it raises the question, why would Mark have added uh, material that seems problematic and left out material that uh, seems so uh, important to anyone who was following the life of Jesus? So those are a couple of reasons why um, people have raised questions about, about the Griesbach hypothesis. Yeah, and, and, and those are basically the same, same issues I, I have with it. it. I mean, imagine, that you're going to, um, you know, put together a, a, a gospel, even a shortened gospel, even let's say you want to do a Reader's Digest version of, of the gospels. Let's say you have Matthew and Luke and, and you're Mark and you want to create a kind of shorter, more succinct uh, gospel narrative and you're deciding what goes in and what goes out. Are you really going to leave out the Christmas stories, the birth narrative uh, that establishes who Jesus is uh, from the beginning. Uh, is that really something that you're, are you really going to leave out, as you said, Ross, the, the Lord's prayer? Uh, is that something that you're going to think is not, uh, you know, worth putting into the text? Um, it also, uh, all of the things that we said when we discussed last time, uh, you know, all the things we said about the uh, literary art of Mark's gospel as, a, as an oral or a spoken uh, gospel that's been written down, uh, you would lose all of that. Mark, Mark wouldn't be the great uh, kind of storyteller that we described uh, last time. Instead, he's, he's perhaps a, a really good editor but that's it, you know. Uh, all of the little things that we pointed out in terms of the, the mark and sandwich, the intercalation, uh, well, then he either kind of edited that or that just kind of happened by happenstance. Uh, so it, it, it kind of diminishes Mark's uh, role as this great storyteller. I mean, at the, at the most, like I said, he just becomes a very good editor. Um, but I, I think, Another thing that makes it really hard to accept is uh, if you just look at Mark and you look at where Mark begins and where Mark originally ended. Remember, Mark ends at Mark 16, uh, chapter 16, verse 8. Uh, you see that structure. I mean, you know, almost all of Mark shows up in Matthew and Luke. Uh, and and in, especially in Luke, Luke is uh, contains you know almost the entirety of Mark. Uh, the places where the agreement in narrative breaks down are precisely where Mark doesn't have something. So Mark doesn't have a Christmas story, and so Matthew and Luke tell two very different Christmas stories. Now. That doesn't mean they don't agree on certain things. They, they agree that Jesus was born of a virgin, born in Bethlehem, uh, that his parents were Mary and Joseph, all things that 
clearly uh, go deep in the tradition, go back uh, to the time of Jesus himself. But the actual narratives that they tell about uh, the, you know, in terms of the Christmas story, and uh, I've talked about this in other adult uh, Sunday schools, uh, highlight totally different things. They, they have different narratives of the Christmas story. Matthew, of course, with, with King Herod and, and the Magi and uh, Joseph being visited in, uh, by an angel in a dream uh, and the slaughter of the innocents, none of which is in Luke. Luke tells a story about Mary being visited by an angel uh, and visiting her cousins, um, Zachariah and Elizabeth, and the birth of John the Baptist, and Mary and Joseph traveling from Nazareth to, uh, to Bethlehem, and uh, the shepherds um, in the fields seeing the heavenly host and then going to um, uh, be there for the for the birth of the child and uh, so very different stories and it's precisely where Mark does, isn't providing a narrative frame for them. Uh, similarly, when you get uh, to the end, uh, Mark 16, 8, after that point, uh, Matthew and Luke follow Mark up to Mark 16, 8, and then their resurrection stories of Jesus are very different. They tell different narratives about Jesus uh, after he was raised and what he did. Um, Matthew putting much more emphasis on the risen Jesus meeting the disciples in Galilee. Uh, Luke staying in Jerusalem, fixating on the temple in Jerusalem, and uh, having, for example, the story of the road to Emmaus, which isn't in uh, Matthew. So, uh, in other words, you see a very uh, close reliance on Mark for narrative structure, and when Mark doesn't provide a narrative, that's when you see Matthew and Luke uh, tell very different stories. Uh, Ross, any, any last thoughts on, on Griesbach before we kind of leave that aside and, and start looking at Mark and priority? One, one footnote, is, which is to point out that Griesbach um, advanced his hypothesis in 1789, 1790, uh, but then the shift to Mark and priority kind of dominated the field in modern scholarship. But in 1960, a man named F.F. F. Farmer uh, essentially renovated the Griesbach hypothesis or, or had a slight variation on it. And so there's been, um, in, in my lifetime, a kind of uh, resurgence of uh, scholarly interest in Matthean priority. It's still the minority uh, scholarly view, but yeah, there we are. Um, some books, you wanna say, say something about those? I, I, I was just, uh, you know, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but, but just these are 20th century books uh, that are arguing for the Griesbach hypothesis. This one, uh, the Gospel of Jesus, The Pastoral Rel Relevance of the Synoptic Problem by William Farmer, who you were just mentioning, uh, and then Sherman Johnson's The Griesbach Hypothesis and Redaction Criticism. So, uh, Yeah, thanks for holding the book. I think I said Farmer's initials wrong. Yes, William Farmer. Um, so just to point out that these uh, there are conferences and debates and monographs and scholarly articles, and people still... Um, are wrestling with the question of which of these, whether the Griesbach hypothesis is in fact viable. Yeah, <clears throat> that's great. Thank you uh, for mentioning that. So, uh, and um, you know, I, that's something I didn't realize was that Griesbach was actually not 19th century, but but uh, as far back as as 18th century, uh, making that argument. Um, uh, so. As you say, by the 19th century, into the 19th century, and certainly by the end of it and into the 20th century, uh, the consensus was Mark and priority, which is just to say that the gospel, to say the gospel of Mark was written first, and that there's some kind of dependence upon Mark by Matthew and Luke. And um, once, you, once you accept that hypothesis uh, of Mark and priority, that Mark was written first, which I, th I think uh, 
Ross, you and I probably would, would agree that that's the most likely scenario. Um, is that right? Yes. Yeah. So uh, once you accept that, uh, you, you still have, the, you haven't gotten out of the synoptic problem yet. Because uh, even if you accept that, that Matthew and Luke have both used Mark for their narrative structure, that they've taken uh, whole chunks of Mark, uh, even word for word in the Greek, uh, and, and transported it into their Gospels, uh, that doesn't explain all of the uh, um, all, all of the shared content between Matthew and Luke. And in other words, there's still uh, teachings of Jesus, things, uh, mostly teachings, but uh, things Jesus did, things Jesus said that Matthew and Luke agree on. Uh, and in some cases with that same degree of, um, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I, it, there, you know, it's still, uh, in some cases, word for word, the same Greek vocabulary, the same grammar, the same syntax, uh, but that's not in Mark. So, so then the synoptic problem, even if you accept Mark in priority, takes on a new uh, element to it, which is how do you explain the uh, shared material between Matthew and Luke that's not in Mark? Uh, and I, I think maybe we'll take a look next at the uh, um, Fair-Goulder uh, hypothesis. And actually, I'm going to take this opportunity, uh, Ross, to ask you, uh, <clears throat> Austin Fair's name, is. am I pronouncing that right? Yeah, yeah that's how I've heard it pronounced, yeah. Okay. Uh, I've heard some other folks uh, pronounce it slightly differently, and I, I've always wondered, am, am I pronouncing it right? But uh, I'll, I'll trust you. So Austin Fair. Yeah, the, the fellow, the theology guy at Sewanee, um, who's done his, did his thesis on Fair, I asked him how to pronounce it, and he said Fair. So. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, that's, uh, that's Rob McSwain. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. Rob, Rob was my uh, advisor on my STM thesis, so... Uh, I should have asked him then, like you, did, but uh, I didn't think to. Um, and and now he's probably if, if if he ever stumbles across this video, he's going to be disappointed that one of his uh, former students wasn't sure how to pronounce Austin. <laughs> he'll he'll be pleased that you mentioned him. That's right. Uh, so uh, let's talk about the the fair uh, Goulder hypothesis uh, again, named after some scholars who put forward this hypothesis. Austin Fair. Uh, and, uh, and Michael Goulder, both of whom uh, were 20th century uh, scholars. Uh, Fair really more known for his um, Christian philosophy and theology than, than for New Testament studies. Uh, but Michael Goulder, most definitely uh, a New Testament scholar. Um, and did you want to say something about the, the Fair Goulder? hypothesis. Yeah, I think I might let you take this one. Um, uh, uh, is this where we're going to talk about Q? Uh, so, no, so this is this is um, the mark and priority, but but without Q. Yeah, I'm gonna let you I'm gonna let you take the lead on this one. All right, let me uh, I'm gonna pull up the share screen again then really quick. And we'll take a look and see uh that's not the one we want this is the one we want uh so the fair golder hypothesis uh is a way of explaining we're going to talk about q for right now let me just use the word and think of it like in an algebraic equation where you have x and you talk about x even though you don't know what x is right that's 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 what q is for us we're it's it's a um, uh, you know it's a part of an equation, but we we don't know what exactly it is, and that's that's actually a good way of thinking about it. But we're going to set it aside for a second. What if you wanted to do the equation without having to posit uh, an unknown like Q? Well, uh, Austin Fair uh, suggested, and uh, and Michael Goulder picked up and argued for. Uh, this hypothesis uh, that begins with mark and priority, uh, 
uh, which is where the consensus of scholarship is, uh, but suggests that Matthew and Luke uh, both used Mark, uh, but that Matthew used Mark first, and then uh, Luke used both Mark and Matthew. Uh, so in this way, you get Mark in priority. Mark provides a narrative structure of Matthew and Luke. You see all the reasons why Matthew and Luke share so much with Mark. They have incorporated Mark into their Gospels. But <clears throat> uh, instead of positing any other source, uh, you know, any other um, unknown source, uh, this simply says that uh, Matthew got a hold of Mark first and added to Mark uh, a whole lot of material that Matthew just kind of knew either through oral tradition or, or some other kind of source known only to Matthew, uh, and that Luke then uh, had in front of him both Mark and Matthew when he wrote his gospel, and that's why he has uh, things in common with both Mark and Matthew, and why he has things in common with Matthew, but not Mark. And this would be, for example, some of the things that Ross has already mentioned, like uh, the Sermon on the Mount, Sermon on the Plain, or the Lord's Prayer, which are in Matthew and uh, in Luke, but not in Mark. Uh, and so the, the answer to why is because Luke uh, had a had a copy of Matthew in front of him and, and took apart, for example, some of the constructions that we see, uh, for example, the Sermon on the Mount, which in Matthew is, is a, a major block of teaching that covers several, several chapters. In Luke, the Sermon on the Plain is much shorter, and many of the pieces uh, that make up the block of teaching that's known as the Sermon on the Mount, Mount in Matthew have been spread throughout the Gospel of Luke. A core of it's been preserved in the Sermon on the Plain, but other pieces have been spe spread throughout in this hypothesis. So, uh, so Luke had Matthew's Gospel in front of him, said, I don't want a big, long sermon that takes up several chapters. I'll take the core of it and put it in my chapter six, and then I'll spread some of the other teachings that are in the Sermon on the Mount throughout my gospel text. So that's the, that's the um, fair Golder hypothesis. And it's really a way of, uh, you might say, applying Occam's razor uh, to kind of cut out anything that, uh, any kind of uh, unknown that we would have to posit uh, to explain this and try and explain it with, with just the texts we have at hand, this, this kind of relationship. And of course, Luke had his own uh, sources along with this uh, that, that he drew on uh, that are unique to Luke alone. For example, the, um, the uh, parable of the prodigal son shows up only in Luke. Uh, that would be uh, something that Luke had on his own. There's one other reason for uh, supporting the Farragolder hypothesis, uh, and that is it seems perhaps to uh, explain some of Papias's statements that we mentioned in our last video, Papias being a church leader, church teacher in the second century, who talked about the uh, relationship of the texts. And he said that there, that Matthew, the, originally Matthew's gospel was a list of logoi or sayings of Jesus. Uh, and that it later got expanded. And this might be a way of, you, you might say, well, that, that is uh, perhaps what Matthew had before he got a hold of Mark. And then he, put his logoi into Mark, and, uh, and then you had, um, you know, you got what we now call the gospel according to Matthew, and Luke just used that uh, to write his own gospel. Uh, and so, so it might be a way of explaining uh, the tradition that Papias is repeating in the second century, maybe. Uh, it, it still takes a little bit of stretching. Papias doesn't quite fit any model that uh, 
that we actually now think is uh, the way that things uh, probably went. But Ross, uh, <clears throat> are you familiar with the Fair Golder hypothesis? No, I'm, 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 you're teaching me something new tonight. Um, I was not aware of this, but uh, it's a, it's a, you know, we're getting back to Occam's razor, where you know the idea is that Occam's razor suggests that the hypothesis that is the simplest and has recourse to the fewest um, uh, unknowns, as it were, X factors. Uh, are is the best. I mean, that's it's, it's a way of arguing, and it's a very elegant solution. I, I, I must say, I'm quite taken with it. <laughs> I, I'm, I might have just converted uh, Ross <laughs> to uh, Fair Golder hypothesis. Well, uh, interestingly enough, um, we mentioned last week uh, in, in our last video, um, John A. T. Robinson, who of course was, was uh, so controversial with his book *Honest to God*, but 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 also took a very uh, unexpectedly, uh, we might say, conservative stand on the dating of the New Testament texts. Uh, and then in our conversation, our Zoom conversation on Wednesday, bringing up John A. T. Robinson also led us to mention uh, a bishop in the American Episcopal Church who. Uh, who saw himself as a kind of um, continuing the work that Robinson had started, and that's uh, uh, the retired Bishop of Newark, um, John Shelby Spong, Jack Spong. Uh, a lot of people, I think, unless they've actually read his uh, Spong's books, uh, for example, uh, Seeing the Gospels uh, Through Jewish Eyes, might not realize this, but Spong rejects the two source hypothesis, which we're about to talk about uh, in the Q gospel uh, in favor of the fair Goulder hypothesis. He finds that one more convincing. Um, and so oftentimes people think, oh, the Q gospel, that's something that, uh, that only those, um, you know, wacky liberal New Testament, uh, you know, scholars are into, and, and then they find out somebody like uh, Spong has rejected Q and, uh, in favor of fair golder but i've actually known a lot of people uh, more theologians i think than new testament scholars who have uh been attracted to the fair golder hypothesis and i think because of that uh that law of of uh parsimony that that occam's razor you know it, it really does kind of cut out something that that we don't know for sure about and and maybe we should go ahead and talk about the unknown now uh so let's let's uh let's move on from fair golder uh i think you know in talking about the two source hypothesis what we'll really be able to do is explain uh why fair golder might what, what some of the problems with fair golder uh with that hypothesis um uh, are uh, why, why, even though it's attractive in some ways, it might not be the best for um, dealing with uh, the material at hand. So why, why don't you introduce uh, the two-source two sure. hypothesis? So just to reiterate what we said before, uh, assuming Mark was risen first, Matthew and Luke both have material that is not in Mark. Matthew and Luke each have material that's unique to their own gospels. They each have their own birth narrative, for example, as, as uh, Nick pointed out. But they have significant amount of overlapping material that Matthew and Luke share, but they didn't get from Mark. And because there's so much verbal agreement in um, this material, and it's, a lot of it is um, sayings of Jesus, Jesus' teachings, Scholars have come to the conclusion that there must have been a document or a source, which we no longer have, but which Matthew and Luke had, and it's referred to as Q because it's from the German word Kavella, or source. It's also sometimes referred to as the sayings source because the material um, that Matthew and Luke share with all this overlap tends to be uh, Jesus' words. Um, Nick is going to tell you in a few minutes about uh, some attempts to reconstruct the document queue. Um, the scholars that I read in preparation for this uh, 
series emphasize that Q is a scholarly hypothesis rather than an actual document. In other words, no one has found a document called Q with all this material. Uh, it's, it's a way of trying to make sense of how um, Matthew and Luke have this overlapping or shared material. And um, I'll let uh, Nick talk a little bit about uh, some attempts to reconstruct Q. But yeah, you can see from this, from this diagram, you got Mark first, um, who's the source for Matthew and Luke. But then Q is also the source for Matthew and Luke. And that would, that would explain, or at least so the hypothesis goes, why we have these um, this sayings material, words of Jesus, that, are, that appear in Matthew and Luke, if not word for word the same, you know, very similar, uh, and material which does not appear in Mark. Yeah, so, <clears throat> so we have here up on the screen, uh, you know, Mark and, and Q, uh, and, and you see uh, Mark is, is both uh, used by Matthew and used by Luke, and then Q is used both by Luke and by Matthew. Uh, roughly uh, around the same time, uh, and so um, so one of one of the questions is: Is this really a better uh, hypothesis uh, than the Fair Goulder hypothesis? Uh, and we could have endless debates about that. Certainly, uh, Ross and I are not going to um, to uh, kind of. Uh, settle that dispute uh, here uh, in this video. Um, I have uh, long been convinced that, that the two source hypothesis makes the most sense, even though it does have to posit uh, an extra source that has never actually been found. You know, there's no Q document that's uh, in a museum somewhere or, uh, or anything like that, not, not even a fragment of uh, the supposed Q source or, or Q saying source. Um, I, I keep calling it Q gospel because some of the books that I have call it that. It really isn't a gospel though, if we think of a gospel as narrating the life, death, and uh, resurrection of Jesus, as, as telling us the good news of uh, God in Christ uh, by way of his life, death, and resurrection. Uh, Q doesn't give us a narrative if there is a cue of the life of Jesus. Uh, the reason why I say that is because uh, if, if Q did provide a narrative like that, then Matthew and Luke would have had to, or there would be some kind of evidence that Matthew and Luke, they wouldn't have had to, but there would probably be some kind of evidence that Matthew and Luke had tried to make the narrative of Q uh, match up with or, or somehow interact with the narrative structure of Mark. And, uh, and there's just no evidence of that. Instead, <clears throat> what we see are, again, mostly sayings of Jesus, uh, which show up uh, as parables and as aphorisms, as um, uh, these logoi or sayings or, or crea, uh, pronouncement stories, uh, crea. Uh, and so, um, that's the assumption is that, that this was a list and we talked about lists as an early move that's made from oral culture to written culture. <clears throat> uh, one of the basic things that you see in uh, the most basic uh, uh, literate functionality in a mostly oral culture is the making of lists. And that's essentially what what uh, folks have said that Q is, is a list of the sayings of Jesus. Now, what, why is this uh, a possibly better um, hypothesis than Fair Golder? Uh, well, one reason is similar to the, the Griesbach. Uh, you have to imagine, if you want to go with the Fair Golder hypothesis, you have to imagine that Luke looked at uh, a beautiful construction of Jesus's sayings like the gospel or like the Sermon on the Mount and said, you know, I think I can do this better. 
and then broke it up and just sprinkled those sayings throughout his gospel rather than keeping them together in this kind of uh, stylistically beautiful and, uh, and um, I think, um, kind of uh, orally persuasive sermon that Matthew has crafted out of those sayings uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why you might say the Fair Goulder hypothesis uh, is, is less convincing. Um, you know, it also is going to push back the dating of Luke. You have to give enough time for Mark to get, be written, copied, spread around, so that Matthew gets a, a, a hold of it. Matthew to write his gospel, for it to be copied and spread around. Uh, and then finally, for Luke to be able to get a copy of both Mark and Matthew, to write his own gospel. This would push, uh, currently, we think uh, Matthew and Luke were probably written around the same time in, in the um, 80s of the first century. Uh, but this would, this would push Luke much later. If, if Matthew were written in the 80s, you have to give enough time for Luke to get a hold of it, uh, a copy of it. Luke might not have been written until the turn of the century. Uh, so it would make Luke particularly late. Uh, also, if we can bring Papias back in, uh, perhaps he just got his uh, names mixed up, and the list of sayings that he says was the original Gospel of Matthew, the list of logoi or, or sayings of Jesus, perhaps that's a reference to Q. Uh, we don't know, of course, that's speculation, uh, but that's, that's a possibility. Well, there are more technical reasons for why folks have argued uh, for um, the two source hypothesis, and I don't want to get into those. I, I do want to mention that uh, a current defender, and I think the Fair Goulder hypothesis has far more defenders than uh, the Griesbach hypothesis. Um, a current defender of it is Mark Goodacre, who's a uh, New Testament scholar. Is he at Duke? I think, he, I, I can't sure. remember. Um, maybe this says, no, this doesn't say, because it was from, I think he's in, he's in North Carolina, at least. <laughs> uh, but he has a book called The Case Against Q. Uh, and he, he holds up the fair uh, Goulder hypothesis. But the majority of scholars have been convinced by looking at the texts laying next to each other and looking at the Greek and and, uh, and the details of that, that the two source hypothesis is a better explanation. Uh, <clears throat> we don't have to resolve that tonight. Uh, I, I'm convinced uh, that, uh, that at least for now, that seems to make the most sense. One of the arguments against the two source hypothesis was that um, this was, this was an argument leveled out because it, it's been around for a while. Uh, for example, um, I, I don't know who first, uh, I can't remember who first argued for, um, for the two source hypothesis in Q, but I do know that Adolf von Harnack, who was uh, an important um, scholar of uh, New Testament and early Christianity and Christian theology in Germany uh, in the early part of the 20th century, uh, made arguments for the two source hypothesis and for Q. So it's been, it's been around for, for quite some time. In those early days, one of the things that was said was, uh, if this is uh, real, it's not just that we don't have a copy of Q, but we don't have anything like this from early Christian literature. There's no example of just, besides Papias's mention of that, there's no example of a list of the sayings of Jesus that just begin, Jesus said this, Jesus said that, you know, in a list like that. And, and at the time, that was a, a pretty devastating critique. Uh, and then in the 1940s, I think it was 1945, actually, uh, the Nagamati uh, Library was found, uh, a collection of texts that we may talk about at a later time, uh, many of which are known now uh, kind of perhaps under the 
unhelpful uh, and, and unwieldy title of Gnostic uh, Gospels and Gnostic texts, but a whole treasure trove of, of ancient Christian documents that uh, are not part of the Bible were found in Nagamati, Egypt in 1945. And among them was a gospel known as uh, the Gospel of Thomas. And essentially the Gospel of Thomas is just a list of Jesus' sayings. Uh, so it's the, exactly the type of document that Q would be. It's not Q. Uh, it's, its list of sayings is different than what we find in Matthew and Luke. But it is a list of sayings attributed to Jesus in the style that scholars uh, thought that, that Q would be found in. I, I can say a little bit more, and I will say a little bit more about um, attempts to reconstruct Q and, and perhaps the community that, uh, that created Q, but I wanted to take a minute and, and just kind of get your reaction to all this, Ross. Well, one point I wanted to make for anyone who has um, been stuck with us so far in this presentation is if you're wondering why bother with all this if it's so inconclusive, uh, I would say this, that paying attention to the differences and the similarities among the Gospels really is helpful for us as Bible readers. For example, once you begin to pay attention to similarities and differences among the synoptics, you notice that Luke has a particular interest in the Holy Spirit, for example, and he has material that's not found in Mark or not found in Matthew, where the Holy Spirit features prominently. For example, his birth narrative, Luke's birth narrative, um, it's full of references to the Holy Spirit, uh, uh, the Zechariah and Elizabeth and Mary and you know, all the events that took place before the birth of Jesus or leading up to the birth of Jesus. It's full of references to the Holy Spirit. So Luke has a real interest in the Holy Spirit. Luke is also very interested in issues of, of poverty and uh, people on the margins. It's not that that doesn't appear in Matthew and Mark, but Luke has a particular angle. So um, if you're wondering, you know, why are we spending all this time on these hypotheses if there's so much uh, that is, remains inconclusive, it's that even if you never figure out exactly which is the correct hypothesis, it, it tunes you in, it, it sort of gets you paying attention to uh, nuances and differences and features of each gospel so that we can uh, hear each of them uh, in his own particular terms. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, <clears throat> it can seem like all of this uh, just begs uh, the, the, the big so what question, uh, you know, why does this matter? And in, and in some sense, uh, you know, which hypothesis best describes the transmission of the, you know, the relationship of the text and the transmission of the tradition. It doesn't, that doesn't, for example, inform my Sunday morning preaching very often. Uh, you know, that's, that's not a big thing. But I think that um, what you're saying is, 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 is actually very, very true and very important. I mean, people, the church, in some sense, uh, kind of ignored the gospel of Mark for centuries. Uh, because why do you need Mark when you've got all the same stories in Matthew and Luke? And, uh, and it, it's in part because of the scholarly consensus around Mark and priority that's, that led scholars to then read Mark on its own terms to see what Mark is doing. And, uh, and, and then that, you know, all of the things that we mentioned in the last video about uh, you know, the, you know, incredible ways that Mark uh, writes as a storyteller became apparent and relatively recently because of this kind of focus. And then, as you say, that allows Luke to stand apart and, and be read for the special contribution that Luke's gospel brings to the New Testament. And when we talk about Matthew and and the ways that Matthew presents Jesus as a prophet like Moses, and, you know, it helps us to see those things also. So, so I think that's a really good point. I do want to um, spend a, a little bit more time on Q, and then we need to maybe, um, change gears and talk about the Didache, because we did promise we'd get to that also. Um, 
since the two source hypothesis that Matthew and Luke use uh, independent of one another, Mark and Q, and we don't quite know what Q is, but we use Q to fill out the sayings, the teachings of Jesus uh, that are, uh, you know, largely missing from Mark's gospel. Mark doesn't spend a whole lot of time presenting Jesus as a teacher, uh, and we talked about that. Uh, after that became the consensus, uh, well, you know, grad students are always looking for new things to write dissertations about, and, uh, and more and more scholars started to uh, focus on the Q gospel or the Q saying source, and to try and uh, understand uh, and perhaps even reconstruct what it might have been uh, like, what it might have looked like. And of course, with the way, the way that they did that was to simply take Matthew and Luke uh, and strip away everything that's clearly from Mark, and then look at what's left that Matthew and Luke have significant agreement on, not just slight agreement on, but significant uh, linguistic agreement on. Uh, and, and then to kind of separate those things out. And again, it's a list of Jesus's sayings or Jesus's teachings. And this has become the nucleus of multiple different reconstructions of what the Q gospel uh, or the Q saying source would have been like. Uh, this has taken many different forms and I actually set up here behind me, uh, most of these books back here are uh, books I have, and these aren't all the books I have, but most of these are books I have on Q, attempts to reconstruct Q, or once that's been done, uh, historically reconstruct the community of Q. Uh, who made this list of Jesus' sayings and uh, what might they have been like? Well, that might seem to be getting super speculative to you, and I, I agree, it, it is... Uh, it is somewhat speculative, but, uh, but there have been some folks, uh, John Kloppenborg, uh, for example, is a scholar who's basically built his entire career as a New Testament scholar on Q. And so some of the books uh, out here are from him, including this one, Excavating Q, the History and Setting of the Saying Gospel. Now, remember, this is a text that's supposed to be uh, shorter than Mark's gospel, which is the shortest of all the gospels. This is just a, a, a short, if we ever find it, uh, if it exists and we ever find it, it's not going to take up a whole lot of space. Uh, but as you can see, uh, John Kloppenberg feels like he can uh, write quite a bit about uh, the reconstruction of the Q saying source and the people who first uh, wrote it down. And that's only one of his books that I have back here. Uh, he was part of a project of, uh, put together by New Testament scholars, uh, included him and another one named James Robinson, who was a really important 20th century New Testament scholar, uh, known as the International Q Project, where they tried to come together and reconstruct the Q gospel uh, or the Q saying source, uh, and they published in 2000 what's known as the critical edition of Q. Remember, this is short. It's shorter than. Let, let's uh, let's just get a comparison here. Here is here is Mark's gospel in my uh, Bible. You see, it's not, not a whole lot of the Bible. Q is shorter than this if it exists. Uh, but the International Q Project has published their critical edition of Q. And as you can see, it's, it's a pretty massive tome here. Uh, now, there's a lot of white space in it, I have to tell you. Um, but... Uh, let me just kind of give you, uh, and I don't know how well this is showing up on the screen. I can see that clearly. Yeah, that's good. Very good. So you see uh, it's got uh, 
the parallels of Matthew and Luke uh, and Mark, and then with the reconstruction here, with the reconstruction of Q is, this is in the Greek, and then uh, below it is, um, depending on which page you're looking at, uh, the, um, the English translation. Uh, and for example, in this case, uh, here's uh, a place where the, the Q uh, has uh, an equivalent in the Gospel uh, of Thomas. Uh, which was written both in Greek and in Coptic. So it's got a little bit of the Coptic in there. But uh, it's pretty incredible to me that people take this hypothetical source uh, so seriously that, uh, that they, they spend careers working on trying to reconstruct it and reconstruct the community that, uh, that might have used it. You might ask yourself, what happened then? Why don't we still have it? If, if, it, if it's true, if it's real, you know, why, why, why don't we have it around anymore? Uh, and the easy answer to that is uh, just that it, what's the point of a list of Jesus' sayings if they've been entirely incorporated into two gospels? Uh, remember, copying is an expensive and uh, time-consuming and uh, uh, laborious process. And if you're already copying the same teachings in Matthew and Luke, why copy them in a, a separate text? And of course, uh, papyrus uh, and even vellum is not the kind of um, material that typically lasts through the centuries. So when, when ancient books like the Nag Hammadi Library or the Dead Sea Scrolls are found, it's because they were stored in a very unique setting, both uh, geographically and temperately, uh, but also in jars meant to preserve uh, these texts. If that didn't happen for a text, it would easily uh, disappear into history, which is what most scholars think happened with uh, the Q saying source. Um, I think that that might be enough to say about that before we move on to the Didache, unless you had anything that you wanted to add. Nope, I think that's, that's a great summary. Thank you. All right. Uh, well, why don't you go ahead and launch us off? Because I feel like I've been talking for a while now. I'll let Nick talk to you a little bit about why we decided to include the Didache in this presentation. But I'll say just a little bit about what it is and um, give you a little bit of a flavor for it. Um, the word didache means teaching, and it refers to a document whose full title is The Teaching of the Twelve Apostles, commonly called the Didache. Um, it consists of two parts. The first is a code of Christian morals often referred to as the two ways, so the way of righteousness and the way of wickedness, the way of life, the way of death, and the second part is a manual of church order, and by that I mean it describes uh, how worship is to be done. Uh, there's a description of baptisms and the type of water to use for baptism. Um, there's a lengthy description of the uh, types of qualities that are looked for for bishops and overseers. There are uh, some fascinating uh, references to false teachers and how to tell the difference between a false prophet and a true prophet, hospitality. It's a whole range of how to conduct life in the church. The date of the Didache is difficult to determine, partially because these two parts come from different provenances. Um, they, they seem to be dated differently, um, but the one possible theory of composition is that around 150, an editor in Alexandria took uh, sources, these um, materials from the two ways, which might have originated in Alexandria, and the material on the church order, which might have come from rural churches in Syria, and combined them into a single document, which this editor then uh, attributed to the apostles. 
It's a fascinating document in part because it shows us the church as it's making the transition from the apostolic period, the life of the apostles, to what's often referred to as the post-apostolic period. And uh, even though it was written in 150, which is obviously significantly later than the death of the older apostles, it uh, gives us a picture of life in the church chronologically earlier. And so it's a, it's a really interesting picture of life in the New Testament community or the Christian community as it was making the transition from uh, its very earliest forms to a type of church life that required more organization and more structure, more details about how the life uh, of the church was to be organized. It also um, is interesting to us because it reveals a little bit of how the canon was developed. Uh, let me just file this by title because it gets a bit more detailed than maybe we want to get into. But um, it has a sort of liberal approach to the canon, we might say, in that the Didacist, the, the, the editor, includes a lot of material from the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. A lot of it reads like bits of the Sermon on the Mount. But he also incorporates material from documents that were not included in our canon. Um, so it's this interesting example of the kind of porous boundaries that existed before the canon was, was formed fully. And um, so for that reason, it's another example of how the, the New Testament came into being. Um, as you read the Didache, you get some insights into the various documents that were being considered as possibly canonical. There's some fascinating snapshots of worship in the early church. There's a Eucharistic prayer, which is really beautiful, which if we have time, we might refer to. Um, so that's just a little bit of a little bit of background to the Didache and why we thought it was worth uh, introducing to you. Nick? Yeah, so I, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's something that's easy to find on the internet. So, uh, so I encourage you uh, to, to find it. It's a short read also, it's, it's not very long. Uh, um, so I encourage uh, all of y'all who are watching or listening to, to find it. And I, I may try and put a link in here um, if I have a chance uh, to um, a place where you can, I think you can both find it to read. And I think uh, on YouTube, there are places where you can find, uh, find someone reading it. Uh, so you can actually hear it read if, if that's what you prefer. Uh, and it's, it's not long. It's shorter than this video is going to end up being, actually. Uh, but um, uh, it's, um, it, as Ross was saying, it's kind of a manual on uh, uh, Christian life and prayer. Uh, and so for this reason, I uh, like to refer to it as the first book of common prayer. Because uh, it, it, in a sense, it, it operated in that way for the community. Uh, that used it or the communities that used it. Uh, it's list, when, when Ross mentioned the two ways, uh, I want to say something about this really quick. Two way, that, that's a kind of jargony term that, that's used uh, sometimes. You see this um, uh, type of literature show up within the Bible and outside of the Bible and, and the ancient world uh, where there's a list of things you should do and a list of things you shouldn't do. And one is said to lead to life and the other one said to lead to death. So we, we see this famously in the Torah or the Pentateuch, Moses lays before the people of Israel two ways and one is the way of life and one is the way of death. We see it in ancient uh, um, Jewish wisdom literature and other wisdom literature and, and we see it in the Didache. Uh, that, that the, there's a, these two ways. Uh, there's a list of things Christians should be doing and a list of things that they shouldn't be doing. Uh, and, uh, and one leads to life and one leads to death, uh, as they say. Although there's an interesting, uh, unique um, perspective taken by the Didache when it gets to the end of its list for the way of life, which is, as Ross said, very similar to the list of Jesus's sayings in uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, so some have suggested a connection either between the Didache and Matthew's gospel or the Didache and the Q saying source. And I'm gonna come back to that a little bit later. 
But when it gets to the end of this list of, of sayings uh, that, that are the way of life, how you should be, and it says, if you want to be perfect, uh, this, is, this is what you do. The way of life is how to be perfect. Uh, and it, it comes to the end of it, and it says, uh, but if you can't do all of these things, do what you can. <laughs> And that's, that's not something that typically you hear in wisdom literature. Usually it's, it's pretty dualistic. If you don't do these things, then you're not going to be perfect and you're not going to live the way of life. Uh, but the Didache offers a little bit of grace. Do what you can, uh, which I think is, is pretty wonderful. Um, and, then, and then it does have rights for, for baptism and uh, rights for Holy Eucharist. And, and here, even in the rites for baptism, we begin to see some of that do what you can mentality. So the Didache says, look, if you're gonna, if, if there's gonna be a baptism, the best way for it to be done is uh, in uh, full immersion in cold running water, living water, running water. Um, but if you can't uh, work that out, then still water's okay. It should still be cold and there should still be immersion, but still water's okay. But if you can't find uh, cold still water, the warm still water, that, that'll do too. And if you can't do full immersion, then, uh, then at least have some of the water poured over top of them. That's okay also. In, in other words, there's that do, do what you can mentality throughout it. Here's the best way to do it. But here's what, what's acceptable. Uh, and I, again, I think that that's uh, a wonderful testimony to grace in the life of this uh, community of Christians, uh, especially when you think about the um, fights in the 16th and 17th century between the Roman Catholics and the magisterial reformers and the Anabaptists over questions of when do you baptize and what should baptism uh, involve and should it be immersion? And people were fighting over this and people were being uh, physically hurt over their answers to these questions. And, but the Didache says, well, do what you can. Um, uh, and it also has a Eucharistic prayer. But here again, uh, we see something interesting. There's a Eucharistic prayer, uh, and Ross may talk a little bit more about this, uh, but it's not like the Eucharistic prayer that we see in 1 Corinthians that draws on the tradition of Jesus's Last Supper. Uh, there's no mention of Jesus's crucifixion. There's no mention of uh, the bread and the wine being the body and blood of Christ. Um, so, so we get a different kind of Eucharistic prayer in this early document, uh, and some have suggested that, some scholars have suggested that we actually see two different Eucharistic prayers put together, a, an earlier Eucharistic prayer in chapter 10 of the Didache, and then um, a, more, a, a later more developed Eucharistic prayer in chapter 9 of the um, of the Didache. Uh, and again, Ross may want to come back to this. So the final thing I want to mention about it is it spends some time talking about a group known as the prophets. Uh, these wandering, uh, you might call them even charismatic uh, Christian leaders who brought the word of the gospel to settled communities. Um, and uh, and it, it's, it's a little bit wary of these folks. Uh, it, it accepts them as authorities and leaders, but it, it provides a whole uh, kind of litmus test of, of um, you know, how do you tell a real prophet from a false prophet? Um, and, uh, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute. I want to hand it back over to Ross for a second, but I'm going to come back to this, these questions about prophets and their relationship but I did want to say one last thing in connection to the Eucharistic prayer. 
one of the things that they say is, uh, here's a Eucharistic prayer that we use. And it's just like, you know, we turn in our book of common prayer and, all right, we've got right one Eucharistic prayer, right two Eucharistic prayer. Is it A or B or C or D? Well, they've got, you know, chapter nine Eucharistic prayer or chapter 10 Eucharistic prayer. But then they say, when the prophet comes into the community, the wandering prophet comes, at that time, let him pray the Eucharistic prayer in whatever way that he's led by the Spirit to pray it, which I think is really fascinating. But I, I want to turn it over to Ross before I get into any of that. Thanks. Yeah, I think my contribution for the Didache would simply be to um, let, let you hear a little bit of it. And so I'm going to pull up my screen share and I'll make this available as a... Uh, a document for you to look at. This is a, an English translation of the Didache, and um, I put at the top where you can find this link so you can read it on your own. And uh, in fact, I'll just scroll through and show you a few things. Under the, uh, the two ways, there's a section on um, the first commandment, loving God and um, loving neighbor, your neighbor as yourself. It's expanded a bit, but you'll see this um, part <clears throat> sounds a lot like the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, love those who hate you. You shall not have an enemy. Abstain from fleshly and worldly lust. If someone strikes you in your right cheek, turn to him the other also, and you shall be perfect. Um, there's some uh, interesting specific moral injunctions. Um, other sins forbidden in chapter three, be neither a filthy talker nor of lofty eye for out of these adulteries, out of these adulteries are engendered. So there's a concern for speech or language. Uh, there's also a concern about um, not being a murmurer, not being a complainer, be not a murmurer or grumbler since it leads to the way of blasphemy. Um, there's some material about divisions and schisms. Uh, the church is enjoined against them. Uh, there's some interesting material about raising children in the knowledge and love of the Lord. Do not remove your hand from your son or daughter. Rather, teach them uh, the fear of God from their youth. Um, let me just scroll down. This is the section that Nick was talking about earlier about baptism. Baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in living water. But if you have no living water, baptize in other water. If you can't do that, do so in warm. And if you don't have either, pour water three times on the head. So Episcopalians really you know, have a place to stand when we do this, uh, our practice of sprinkling. Here's the Lord's Prayer, which is included. Um, this is the, um, a little bit of the material of the Eucharistic prayers that Nick was referring to. When the breaking of the bread is done, we thank thee, our Father, for the life and knowledge which you have made known to us through Jesus thy servant. To thee be glory forever. Even this broken bread was scattered over the hills and gathered together and become one. So let thy church be gathered together from the ends of the earth. So there's an emphasis on the joy of the community gathered together at the table. And um, there is also in the prayer after communion, some similar emphasis on the joy of God's um, presence through creation and of the hope that we have for Christ's return. And it's a little bit different emphasis than entered the church not too long after this, where the death of Christ and the atonement of Christ, Christ's death for our sins was moved to, to the center of the Eucharistic theology. And in my own lifetime, I can remember when the prayer book that we now use, 1976, uh, was being adopted, there was often, um, the point was often made that the 1928 prayer book reflected the older Eucharistic emphasis, which was pretty exclusively on Christ's sacrificial death, whereas in the current prayer book, there was an attempt to recapture some of this earlier emphasis on the fellowship meal and the joy of gathering uh, an expectation of Christ's return. So you can read through those prayers on your own and see if you think it reflects that. Here's our section on the prophet uh, speaking in the spirit that Nick was referring to. I love this. Um, there's a whole section about how to show hospitality and how not to be uh, jerked around by somebody who's just a loafer and wants to not do any work. Um, 
if a wayfarer comes, assist him as far as you can, um, but he shall not re remain with you more than two or three days, if need be. But if he wants to stay with you and is an artisan, let him work and eat. But if he has no trade, according to your understanding, see to it that as a Christian, he shall not live with you idle. But if he wills not to do, he is a Christ monger. Watch that you keep away from such. Uh, and there's another, another translation that puts this, um, if the person has a trade, let him engage in a trade so that he can eat, but don't let him trade on Christ. In other words, use Christ as an, as an excuse for coming into the community. So um, there's just a little bit of a flavor of the Didache, and I'll, I'll uh, post this, or we'll, have, we'll make this available for you to read at your leisure. Uh, there are a number of different translations, but this one you can find uh, at earlychristianwritings.com. That's great. So, uh, you know, in looking through that um, that text, when, when we see the, um, you know, the first the focus on uh, living out the Christian life with the two ways, and then uh, the movement into uh, the two what we would call sacraments uh, or mysteries of the church, baptism and Eucharist, and how to do these things. Uh, and you'll notice that they're tied very closely together, just as they are in our current prayer book. Our, our, in that way, our prayer book uh, was inspired not just by the Didache, but some other um, uh, early Christian liturgical uh, texts that really tied closely baptism and Eucharist. And I don't know if y'all noticed as Ross was scrolling down, but one of the things that it says is that no one should uh, partake of the Eucharist until they've been baptized. Uh, and we see that uh, in this very, very early uh, liturgical text of the church um, because the two go hand in hand. Um, and, uh, and, and then, then it moves into this discussion of the prophets. Um, I want to put forward to you one uh, perspective that uh, I have found persuasive, uh, and you may or may not, for how to understand both uh, Q and the Didache, uh, at least early sections, early portions of the Didache. As, as Ross pointed out, we may have several different written traditions that have been uh, compiled there in the Didache, but but in uh, some of these early traditions, especially around the sacraments and um, and around the, uh, the the wandering prophets, there was a uh, a book that came out, I, I believe, in the '70s uh, by a New Testament scholar called Gerd Tyson, and it was uh, sociology of uh, of early Palestinian Christianity or of Palestinian Christianity, something along those lines. And what Tyson picked up on was that there seems to be a lot of itineracy in both the New Testament and some of these uh, added or extra texts beyond the New Testament like the Didache. We see Jesus is constantly traveling from place to place. There's a scene early in Mark's gospel where Jesus comes to Capernaum, uh, where he heals Peter's mother, and then many people start flocking to Jesus. And he heals them, uh, and, you know, it seems like he's doing this all night long, and the disciples fall asleep, and then early in the morning before the sun's risen, uh, they can't find him. Peter goes out to look for him, and Jesus says, uh, it's time for us to go. Uh, we're not going to stay here. We're going to, it's time for us to move on. Uh, and uh, the New Testament scholar, uh, uh, John Dominic Crossan has said, you know, at that moment, you could, you could probably just hear uh, this, this uh, kind of groan from Peter because here he had the best possible situation. Set up Jesus in his own home he would get all this honor from having this prophet who heals people stationed out of his own home. And he could make Cap uh, Capernaum his base and, and, uh, and it would bring honor to Peter and his family. And they could set up this nice little situation where people come to hear Jesus uh, preach and teach and then get healed by him. 
Uh, and instead, Jesus says, no, that's not the way the kingdom comes. We, we've got to move on to the next town, the next town. Jesus is always moving around. The kingdom isn't located in one particular place. Something very similar to what Jesus says to the uh, woman at the well in uh, Samaria, you know, that, that um, you Samaritans worship God on Mount Gerizim, and we Jews worship God on Mount Zion, but uh, the time is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, um, because uh, as such the Father seeks to worship him. The, the Father is spirit himself, and so we see uh, the kingdom of God's not going to be localized, so there's a lot of movement in the Gospels. Jesus is always moving itineracy. Paul in, the, in his letters is always going somewhere and he's always telling you where he's been and where he's going next or why he's not going anywhere because somebody's locked him up. Uh, and uh, so we, we see itineracy just fill these texts uh, and we see it also in the Didache. We see that there are um, wandering prophets, as they say, who bring the gospel, they bring the word of God, uh, but you know, you've got to be a little bit wary of them, um, it, because uh, even by this early stage in the first century uh, in Christianity, there are, there are folks who have learned that you can take advantage of Christian charity. Uh, it happened from the very beginning. Um, uh, the translation Ross was reading called them Christ uh, mongers, uh, or I've also seen translations refer to them as the Christ hustlers. Uh, in Greek, they're the, the Christemporoi, uh, you know, from the same word we get the word emporium from. Uh, they're the ones who trade on Christ, uh, as opposed to the Christians, uh, and, uh, and the Didache has already recognized that there's folks like this. Um, uh, and so, uh, you have to be careful about them, and that's why it gives these different uh, rules for how to, how to figure out who's a real wandering prophet and who's just uh, trying to uh, get a free meal out of all this. Uh, and um, <clears throat> what Crossan has suggested, based off of Ger Tyson's work, is that uh, really, so uh, let me go back for a second. Tyson and those who have followed him in this uh, perspective, and there are those who, who have argued against it, like Richard Horsley, and we don't need to get into that, but, but Tyson uh, has kind of suggested that there was almost a, a, a two-tier kind of Christianity uh, in, these, in this first century. There's the real Christians who have given up everything to follow Christ. They've taken on the itinerant and ascetic lifestyle wandering around in this way, having no home, you know, uh, foxes have dens and uh, birds of the sky have nests, but the, but the son of man and those who follow him have no place to lay their heads. And so they, they follow Christ, they've given up everything, they're wandering around, they rely on the communities. These are the true Christians, the prophets, and then they're supported by a kind of second class who are interested in the message, uh, but not ready to give up uh, their peasant lifestyle or their uh, retainer lifestyle and follow it. That, that's kind of, it's, a, it's an oversimplification, maybe, maybe even a, a, a caricature of, of Tyson's position, but it, that there's something to that in, in Tyson's work. What Crossan has suggested is that that's a misunderstanding, that in, in fact, um, it's really an interactive relationship. Uh, between the itinerants and the householders who accept them. And he has suggested, John Dominic Crossan has, that the two texts that really reflect these two communities that come together and in their interaction are church or in their interaction are, are uh, in some way make present the kingdom of God, um, are the Q saying source and the Didache. The Q saying source is a list of the kinds of words, gospel, the, the sayings, the teachings that the wandering prophets would bring. Uh, and the Didache is 
the response of the communities that would welcome in these prophets uh, and would invite them to pray the Eucharistic prayer uh, in whatever way the Spirit moved them to, um, but also had to be careful that these were true prophets and, and had to discern which prophets were true prophets and which ones were just trying to take advantage of the community. And so uh, I, I don't know if this is right or not. Obviously, it's, it's historical reconstruction. It, it's, it's built on a degree of speculation. But I find this a very attractive view of, of the first century church, particularly this would be in Galilee and the northern Galilee and up into Syria. Uh, these communities of householders who would welcome in these wandering prophets, the wandering prophets would bring the teachings of Christ, the word of Christ, perhaps even in the spirit bring healing in the way that Christ brought healing. Uh, and these householders who are represented in the Didache, or at least in early versions of the Didache, would uh, would receive them and provide them with the food they need for the day. Uh, so, you know, the answer to the Lord's prayer, give us this day our daily bread, give them their daily bread, they would break bread together in the Eucharist. Uh, and that in that interaction, uh, the church uh, became, the community became a, a, a kind of symbol of the kingdom of God being present uh, in, the, in that time and in that place. So, that I just wanted to lift that up. Ross, in, any uh, response to that or thoughts on that? No, that's, that, that that's a fascinating, uh, fascinating thesis. I hadn't heard that before. Yeah. And again, uh, you know, ultimately there's, there, you know, these aren't the kinds of things that you can find a whole lot of hard evidence for. It, historical reconstruction doesn't really work like that. So, you know, you, you, you deal with the text and you try and figure out what they're saying and to whom they're saying it. And, and, uh, and that's just one way of looking at it that I've particularly found very persuasive. Um, so we've, we've talked about a lot. We've talked about the synoptic problem. We've talked about the standard solution uh, known as the two source hypothesis that Matthew and Luke are both dependent independently of one another. They are both dependent on the gospel of Mark and the Q saying source. And we've talked about the Didache as an early book of common prayer in a sense that, that may reflect uh, a relationship between the communities that receive these wandering prophets represented by the teachings in the Q saying source. Um, I think that's a lot for us to cover and, and we may need to wrap it up now, but I wanna, Ross, do you have any final words to say? No, I just this has been a really stimulating conversation, and um, I appreciate all the work you've done on the on the Q material. I've learned learned some things I didn't know about Q tonight, and um, I just would encourage anyone who's interested in learning a bit more about the Didache to 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 spend a little time reading it. it takes about 10, 15 minutes to read quickly, and uh, it'll I think you'll sense that you're plunged into this fascinating boundary period uh, between what we know of as the New Testament and, and what happens later in the church. So it's really, it's a, it's a wonderful read. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you so much, Ross, and I look forward to talking with you and, uh, and um, our parishioners from the Fort Church on Wednesday about, uh, about these topics some more. I am too. All right, take care. Thanks.